So the case was that of a 92-year-old uh, lady, uh, a retired violinist um, who used to tour the world with her husband uh, yeah, as professional musicians. She presented uh, on this time with worsening heart failure, really decompensated heart failure, with symptoms at home, class 3, 4. This had occurred on a background of a history of a transcatheter aortic valve implantation um, a year earlier uh, for low flow, low gradient, uh, severe AS. She uh, had chronic atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and fairly advanced chronic kidney disease. And she also had rheumatoid arthritis with a long history of intermittent steroid use and methotrexate use. The result following the TAVI uh, procedure a year earlier was excellent with only trivial paravalvular leaks. So we were confident of the competency of our aortic valve repair, but uh, this lady now presented with worsening heart failure for further assessment. She was on maximally tolerated medical therapy, and we can talk about what that means in the uh, final Q&A session of today. Uh, it obviously doesn't mean you take everything at the maximum dose. These are elderly patients, and there's a limit to what they can tolerate. So the operating word is maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy. She was on rhythm and more really rate control, and amiodarone was used mainly as a rate controlling agent here. Um, and um, she lived alone at home and was independent in her activities of daily living and still keen to go on doing so. So some of her preliminary investigations uh, showed uh, coronary angiography uh, to show mild to moderate diffuse coronary artery disease, so no significant obstruction, no coronary artery disease to be corrected in this lady. Um, she had atrial fibrillation on the ECG with left bundle branch block with a fairly well-controlled rate, but still at times uh, up to 100 beats a minute, so not completely uh, adequately controlled. Her renal function was moderately impaired, probably severely impaired when you look at the EGFR. And when we calculated her EGFR for uh, this particular patient due to her low weight, it was actually lower than the standard reported one in the blood tests and uh, came in at only 12. Um, her hemoglobin was fairly normal and her NT pro and P was uh, quite elevated as she presented on this occasion. So we did some pre-procedural imaging thinking that this lady uh, might benefit from further intervention if we could demonstrate a, a cause for her symptoms. And when we did the trans echo, it showed severe, well, three plus four plus severe mitral regurgitation uh, of functional etiology. You've heard Kunwa Batia's talk today talking about the etiology and the pathophysiology of closing forces and tethering forces. And we thought that in this lady, she had a combination of uh, secondary mitral regurgitation due to ventricular and atrial causes. And RV function was fairly well preserved, uh, an important factor as well in determining the outcome of these procedures. And her TR, not shown on this image, was moderate. And the estimated pulmonary artery systolic pressure at 60 to 65, so um, fairly moderate to severe. Other views confirmed the presence of severe mitral regurgitation. We assessed the mitral valve area on 2D in this case and later on 3D and found it to be just below four square centimeters, but close enough that we could consider using a single clip for this patient, but definitely not two clips. A mean mitral valve gradient was two. Next, we did some um, toe imaging and again found the uh, left ventricle to be severely impaired with some element of dyssynchrony. An ejection fraction in this view of approximately 30%. In other views, maybe slightly better than that. The left atrium was markedly enlarged. You could also see on the previous view that there was tinting uh, of the leaflets and a flattening of the coaptation point suggested that ventricular causes were not the only one at play in this lady, but atrial uh, fibrillation uh, also having uh, a significant or playing a significant role. This is a long axis or left ventricular outflow tract view, the uh, grasping view for the either mitroclip or Pascal procedure. And here you can see the mobile length of the posterior leaflet in particular, which is important, and also the degree of tethering. And again, it appears that there's an A2P2 
the two leaflet segments that you're looking at in this view, uh, defect with a significant jet in this area. In the bicommissural view, we are looking at the width of the jet and we're looking across the mitral valve. And here you can see the jet is still fairly central, um, medial being on the left side of your screen, uh, lateral on the right side. And so there's a particular jet sort of on the medial side of A2P2, but there's a fairly wide jet. Going to the 3D, um, it did show a significant co-optation defect, as you can see here. You can sometimes dial uh, uh, the um, contrast up or down, and this will impact on the degree of the defect you're seeing. But it looked like there was a very broad and significant co-optation defect here with a very tethered posterior leaflet. Uh, and it also confirmed a predominantly functional or secondary cause, not, not, not too much degenerative mitral regurgitation. Again, the main part of the jet was just on the medial aspect of uh, A2P2. So this was the surgeon's view or left atrial view that Grace Scalia told, talked about in his talk earlier today, where the aorta is in, on top at 12 o'clock, the posterior leaflet uh, down at the bottom, six o'clock coming across, and medial is on the right side of your screen and lateral on the left. Pulmonary venous flow showed uh, systolic blunting, suggestive of at least three plus, if not more. And the mobile part of the posterior leaf that was adequate for just adequate at seven to eight millimeters for a uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair. A leaflet length of less than seven millimeters uh, becomes difficult to ensure you get enough leaflet insertion. Given that this lady had had a, a, a TAVI CT already when she had her TAVI procedure, we thought we would use the images to look for evidence of calcium, which is much better seen on a CT than transesophageal echocardiography. And we found that there was only very limited calcium in the posteromedial aspect of the posterior leaflet and predominantly at the base or near the annulus rather than, and there was no calcium extending onto the grasping zone, which was thought to be close to A2P2 center, maybe slightly medial of center. So we took this lady to the heart team meeting. And as you've heard today at the heart team meeting, we like a number of people present. There was a surgeon, interventional cardiologist, aged care physician because of the patient's age, an interventional imaging cardiologist, a heart failure specialist uh, to see if she was on maximally tolerated therapy and our structural heart disease coordinator. There was a discussion about various aspects of this lady's care. One, should she have surgery or a transcatheter itch repair? Two, would CRT be considered, which was not an unreasonable question to ask. And three, if a transcatheter itch to itch repair was being contemplated and decided upon, which device would we use and why? So the first question was surgery or transcatheter uh, approaches. That was fairly straightforward in this case because she had already had a TAVI and had been knocked back for surgery as a high risk patient. Her STS score was in the high risk, not prohibitive, but high risk. And I think based on the patient's age, comorbidities, uh, STS score, previous transcatheter procedure, and echocardiographic findings, which suggested that a single clip was an option, we decided on a transcatheter edge to edge repair. The next question was whether this lady would benefit from CRT. Um, we did get a consult uh, to assess this. And uh, at the time, uh, the obstacles to CRT were seen at, as the very low EGFR and the possibility of having to use contrast usually not a great amount, but still perhaps a significant amount given the EGFR was close to single digits. And uh, secondly, we felt the degree of MR was unlikely to be completely resolved by CRT. And thirdly, we felt that if she had to undergo a transcatheter edge to edge repair shortly after CRT, we might interfere with the coronary sinus lead. So it was decided at the time uh, by the heart team uh, that CRT could be a later option and that transcatheter edge to edge repair would proceed. Finally, we decided on a Pascal uh, device for this patient, mainly because of the large co-optation gap we had seen on the, trans, uh, on the 3D transesophageal echo. The allowance for independent grasping, uh, moving a course, grasping the leaflet that's too far away to 
allow for simultaneous grasping was a was an attractive feature of the Pascal device for this particular case. You're also very keen to get away with one clip and felt the Pascal device is slightly wider and perhaps uh, allowed for this to happen better. This is a brief video of the uh, Pascal. Uh, we put the guide across the septum from the right atrium to the left atrium. We then introduced the clip uh, system. It's prepared, then steered down towards the mitral valve. Again, we allow for adequate orientation in the 3D and 2D views. We pass the clip into the ventricle, pull it back against the leaflets, and once we're happy, we uh, lower the clasps and we then let go of the clip only once we've, we're happy that we've got adequate leaflet insertion, no significant gradient, and a significant reduction in MR. So the Pascal system consists of three main parts. They move independently of each other, and the steering is certainly different uh, than that of the mitre clip. Um, it's a 22 French system, so it's uh, slightly smaller than the mitre clip system. And as mentioned, it has a number of features that is not yet available for the uh, G3 mitre clip uh, system. It has optimized leaflet capture and independent leaflet grasping, which can be a benefit. It can also introduce some, some problems. So it's important to be aware of the limitations of this uh, technique. The broad paddles and the make of nitinol allows for um, a more gentle approach to the leaflets with a, a reduced risk of, of uh, leaflet tearing and damage. And the spacer helps with this too. And finally, the bailout procedure with this device is probably safer than the mitral clip. You elongate the device and there are no grippers in sight. Remember on this device, there's only one set of retention rows as opposed to multiple. And I think your chance of getting the clip entangled in uh, the cordy is less probably with this system than uh, some of the other systems available. So we went on to treat this lady with a, with a Pascal device. Uh, the transeptal puncture is more or less the same as for the mitre clip device. We try to puncture posterior and, uh, and fairly high in the septum. The height may be slightly less important with this device. Um, we measure the height before we make the puncture and 4.9 centimeters was acceptable in this case. And we then pass our transeptal sheath across into the left atrium. We obviously hypnotize the patient at this point to avoid clotting. One thing we've been doing for a while, which we learned from some of our European colleagues, was to do a left atrial angiogram in the uh, RAO projection, sometimes slightly caudal, sometimes slightly cranial. Uh, this will give you a good idea where the mitral uh, valve is. Uh, it'll show you the lateral aspects of the mitral valve, the medial aspects, and you can then steer the clip down and you will always know roughly where you are because you have this in your mind as you do the procedure. It shows also other important structures that you want to stay away from with a mitral clip or a Pascal device, such as the left atrial appendage. And finally, it shows you the roof of the left atrium so that you can introduce your clip or Pascal device without any fear of uh, moving it through the left atrial roof or wall. So we find this quite, uh, quite a useful feature. It takes about 10 mils of contrast. And even in this lady, that was not thought to be prohibited. Next, we placed our uh, Pascal device uh, in the left atrium. We steered it down to the mitral valve, which doesn't take very long once you know where the roof is. Uh, the left main bronchus is also a marker of the roof of the left atrium in this particular projection. And so that's another way of doing it if you really don't want to use contrast. We did our clip orientation. Because it has independent grasping capability, you need to understand there are two controls for the clasps and you need to understand which controls the posterior and the anterior leaflet. And so you test this out before you go into the ventricle with the device. You test your orientation and if you're trying to clip A2P2 in the center of the mitral valve, you really want more or less a 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock orientation of your clip. If you're moving more medially, you might go more 11.5. If you're moving laterally, you might go 1.7. And so this varies a little bit. And Greg showed you beautiful images this morning of how you can use either in QLAB in preparation for the case or actually live the MPR function of some of the uh, very latest uh, TOE uh, probes and machines. 
Next, we pass the clip through into the ventricle and you make sure you can see both paddles in this case uh, very well um, so that you know that you have not rotated. You can also check this on fluoroscopy. In this view, you can tell we've lowered the clasps. Uh, you can tell the posterior leaflet is in very well. It goes very, more or less to the apex between the paddle and the clasp, and you can see the clasp moving so that we've got a good bit of posterior leaflet uh, grasped and inserted. Um, on the other side, uh, it's a little harder to be sure about the anterior leaflet. So we did some leaflet optimization of the anterior leaflet. You do this by raising the, the clasp, you slightly rotate or um, move forward or backwards in and out of the ventricle, only very tiny movements, obviously, the clip um, and or the device. And then you uh, try, you can visualize the anterior leaflet. And once it lays on the paddle and reaches the apex, you then lower the clasp again. On fluoroscopy, the sign of a good leaflet insertion is that you can see the clasps moving a bit like a flying bird. And uh, once that is seen, it means that you've got adequate leaflet insertion. Next, we close the clip. Um, and you can see here the nitinol, which is a sort of flexible material, uh, allows for a little bit of clip flexibility and movement through the cardiac cycle. Uh, and, and this may be a nice feature of this device, um, which uh, distinguishes it from some other devices. Our clip had moved more medially than we had anticipated, um, but we assessed the result all the same because we, uh, you, you'll recall the jet was a little bit on the medial side of A2P2. We've generated or we've, met, we've created a double orifice valve. And you can see that the um, MR reduction, at least on 3D, which is not the only way to assess it, obviously, appeared quite substantial. Next, we look at, looked at it in the uh, LVOT view in 2D. Uh, and again, we were very happy. You can see several small jets and you might think they add to up, up to something substantial, but remember color flow after mitral clip insertion is not a terribly accurate way of assessing the severity of MR, as you heard from Lisa Simmons earlier. We saw the, uh, the uh, a spontaneous echo contrast increase, a good sign that you've uh, significantly reduced DMR. The mean gradient before releasing the device was two, which is very adequate. And pulmonary venous flow, you can see here before and after, uh, suddenly uh, normalized. Um, and left atrial pressure, which we were not monitoring live, like in, in Martin's case, which I I particularly like live monitoring. That's actually a very good thing to do. You can instantly assess the effect of your, of your grasp on, on the V-wave and left atrial pressure. But all the same, there was a very substantial reduction in V-waves from 28 to about 12, so uh, more than a halving. So we were happy leaflet insertion was assessed also to let go of this clip. And um, you'll agree that it looks like a very stable grasp after we let go. There's not a lot of movement. That usually is a good sign that you've got good leaflet insertion. We did uh, toe multiplanar reconstruction for assessment of the area and found an area, combined area of 3.4 square centimeters uh, on planimetry. The gradient had reduced further after releasing the device to one. And on day one, uh, Assessing the patient's outcome by transthoracic echo, we were very happy with the result, seeing mild or maybe mild to moderate um, mitral regurgitation. So a very acceptable result in this patient. So what has happened to her since? At six months follow-up, um, she continues to live independently. Uh, she has had an improvement in her symptoms, more or less on the same medical therapy to class one. Her MR grade is probably mild to moderate and she has had no late procedural complications.